What up, Cavs Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk Podcast. Chris, I am so happy to see you back at home as we get ready for another home game at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse as the Cleveland Cavaliers take on the Chicago Bulls for the second time in the same week on Friday night. It is the first game of the NBA Cup for the Cavs and the Bulls. And Chris, I feel like we can get a little creative here before we get into the nuances of the game itself. What do you think about the City Edition jerseys and the court that were released and announced uh, earlier today? Oh, man, we're going to start there. Um, how can I put this? So, So the color that they use, that is one of my favorite colors in the world. Um, anybody that knows me knows that I love baby blue, powder blue, Carolina blue, however you want to phrase it or characterize it. That is my favorite color in the world. I have multiple hoodies in that color. I have a puffy vest in that color. I have shoes to match that color. So I love the color that they chose. And I also love the fact that they are doing very Cleveland specific thing and they're tying it into um, different places, like a couple of years ago, they did the Metro Parks, right? Um, last year, they did the theater district. And, and they're finding the things that are Cleveland, and they're tying those together, just like they did this time around. I'll say that there have been worse designs. There have been designs that have not been as appealing to me personally, and those were early on in the City Edition days. So I do... I do like the color scheme. I do like the theme that they used. I do like the execution that they used. Um, So so I think they did a good job. Is it like my favorite jersey that I've ever seen the Cavs wear? No. But I I think for what they were going for, the execution was really, really good. And anytime you can have that particular color, I'm going to be a fan of it. I also like the idea, Ethan of making it more trendy and using the land. That's something that I thought they needed to do a number of years ago. They did start doing it a number of years ago. Um, whether whether people, well, whether the majority of people like it or not, that has become synonymous with Cleveland. That has been the trendy hip term for Cleveland. And I dig it. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I like the jerseys, um, and I like the land as as the middle piece. I like that a lot. Um, the only reason I would have disagreed with what you said was because you said Carolina blue. That's the only <laughs> way you cannot classify the color. You can say baby blue. You can say sky blue. You can say whatever else you want. You say Carolina blue, we're going to have an issue. But I Why are we going to have an issue with that? Not a Carolina fan. Anyway, anyway. Topic for another day. Topic for another day. But yeah. um, what I was worried about is we remember last year, last season, the in-season tournament. We also talked about it um, with the games that we watched that already had in-season tournament games. I believe it was on mm. Tuesday. And there were courts, once again, Chris, that were hard to look at, <laughs> right? And and. and Fully the same color, and I saw the baby blue color for the jerseys, and I hadn't seen the court yet, and I immediately got word because I was like, if the Cavs are playing on an entirely baby blue court, that is, one, going to be a distraction, and two, going to be hideous on an actual basketball court. Yeah. But they actually did it really well. They have the baseline and the exterior as a baby blue color, and then they have a stri- a strip going through that is actually just the regular color of a basketball court ordinarily. And I think that's really well done. But enough of the fun talk, enough of everything going on else around. We got a basketball game to talk about, but I don't want to talk about the basketball game as much as I want to listen to or hear what our subtexters have to ask and another rendition of Hey Chris. And Chris, this week we did something a little bit different. We sent a text over to our subtexters asking them and sending them a link to go give their feedback on the podcast itself. 
They were able to tell us what they liked, what they didn't like, and give feedback on things like how long they think the episode should be, what should we be talking about, what they enjoy hearing from us, and what they don't. But, Chris, we got some great reviews, and we got some things we got to work on. And I am intentional about keeping those in mind going forward. But, Chris, when we talk about the questions that we got from our subtexters relating to this team, relating to the game coming up against the Bulls, the first one comes from our guy, Dave from Tucson. Dave has been a guy that has been active in our subtext group ever since I joined last year. Shout out to Dave. He then says, when Max Drews is back, Jalen Tyson is going to be further down the depth chart. How is Jalen Tyson handling the lack of playing time? Is there any chance of him getting some reps in the G League just to stay sharp? And Chris, I know we talked about this briefly about him uh, getting reps with the G League, him being in conversation with Kenny Atkinson about being down there with the Cleveland Charge just to get reps and all those different things. He actually even attended one of the Cleveland Charge games um, when they got their season started. I think it was a couple weeks ago. Chris, do you have any more insight on where the situation lies with Jalen Tyson? So, so much of his work is happening behind the scenes, Ethan. And and I think he's staying sharp, as sharp as he possibly can. Um, He's putting a lot of focus and determination on those workouts that he's doing um, with various members of of the team that are also kind of in the same situation with him. Uh, Craig Porter Jr., JT Thor, Luke Travers, that has kind of become a post shoot around workout group, especially when they're on the road and they're working very closely with shooting coach Andrew Olson and the Cavs new player development coach as well. And they're trying to make it fun and they're trying to make it competitive as well. And they're doing things from a player development standpoint um, that they think are going to benefit these players once they actually get there on the court. Like there are some drills where they're only allowed to drive to their left and use their left hand to finish. There are some other drills where they're only allowed to take one dribble from the three point arc and then determine how they're going to finish. Are they going to do a Euro? Are they going to do a floater? Are they going to do whatever it is when they get into the lane and they have to finish over the top of, of another assistant coach who's holding up a thing that kind of looks like a broom, but it extends their hands so that they can, challenge the shot a little bit more. So those things are happening behind the scenes. And I can tell you that they get intense and all these guys like want to win them. And the the friendly competitions that they're having, um, either following practice or following shoot around. In fact, we were in shoot around in Chicago and Donovan Mitchell was doing his media availability and he saw out of the corner of his eyes, that group working at a side basket, Craig Porter Jr., Jalen Tyson, and some of the other guys. And Jalen Tyson went all out, and I think he blocked a shot. And Donovan paused, and he was like, oh, so that's what we're doing this morning. Okay. So, look, no player is going to be thrilled about the fact that a majority of their rookie season, the development, the opportunities are going to take place behind the scenes and they're not going to come in a game situation. But that's what happens when you're the 20th pick. That's what happens when you join a team that brought back 13 of 14 um, full-time regulars from the previous team that just so happened to advance to the Eastern Conference semifinals. There just isn't a whole bunch of opportunity. So I think Jalen Tyson is trying to make the most of the other opportunities behind the scenes, getting to the arena earlier so he can go through his individual workouts. Like I said, staying later after shoot around, staying later after practice and and doing everything that he can do to stay ready and stay mentally sharp, just in case some unforeseen um, circumstances arise where he starts to climb up the depth chart. But there just isn't room for him in this rotation right now. Um, and I think the Cavs understand that. And, and I think there are going to be some conversations internally in the next coming weeks about whether it makes sense to send Jalen um, down to the G League and, and see if he can get some meaning, meaningful playing time and some meaningful reps down there. And we talked about this following last year, right, Chris? Like confidence is something that derives from reps. It derives mm-hmm. from getting 
acclimated in game against other <laughs> opponents where you can see yourself. And I talked to Jalen Tyson at, at media day and he, after summer league, after he gets his first little taste of the NBA and he says, I think that I am one of the best rookies in this class. Right. And that is due to playing a lot of rookies in that summer league, all those different things. He even circled imaginarily. He was like, I wanted to go into that Lakers game and show them that they had the number 17 pick and he wasn't better than me. Right. Mm -hmm. And in that game specifically, he said he felt like he did that. And obviously Dalton connect is the guy that he was talking about going up against for the Lakers. He's going to have a completely different role than what the Cavs have going on in Jalen Tyson's situation just because of the roster and what Dalton Connect can bring off the bench shooting-wise that Jalen Tyson is still working to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Jalen Tyson, for me, is a guy that can thrive off of confidence, can thrive in a system that Kenny Atkinson is working on. He's just not to the level and to the caliber that they need him to be to be able to take or fall into a role like Karis LeVert or Ty Jerome at this point in his career. Obviously, it's his rookie season. But you think about, and you mentioned Craig Porter Jr. That's a guy that I like having him around because it's not just talking about you had an opportunity where there were a lot of injuries and you weren't expecting to be in an NBA lineup at all last year, but understanding Mm -hmm. how to operate in that mindset, thinking like you're going to be at the end of the bench. But there are going to be opportunities, and you have to make the most of them so they have confidence in you going forward. Or you go down to the G League, like Craig did, I think once or twice maybe, and said, hey, I'm too good to be down here. I have to at least be either in a rotation or a thought process when it comes to this lineup, this league, and all these different things. So Jalen Tyson competing with Craig Porter Jr. is great. Also, Jalen Tyson being around uh, Donovan Mitchell is great as well. And then you throw in the little wrinkle of Imani Bates in that conversation, who is a competitor in himself. I remember when we were in Boston last year during the playoffs talking about him going up at like these end of practice workouts with Pete Nance at the time and uh, Mm -hmm. all these guys that were there. And Amani, after every shot, every miss make, like he has some exasperated <laughs> like reaction. If he makes it, like it's a celebration. If he misses, he's slapping the wall. Like so, you think about the comp- competitive level that these guys have. They made it to the NBA. They either were drafted or were signed or whatever. There's a different level of competitiveness for every single guy that is on this roster. But Chris. The next question comes from Scott in Greensboro, North Carolina. He asks, after 13 games in, as the Cavs are 13-0, and 0, have you revised your win total for the Cavs and where you have them standing at the end of the season? Oh, God, I think you have to. Right, because that's what this business is. Like, you gain more information on a daily basis. Um, so that you don't have to lock yourself into something that you thought previously, something that you believed previously, or something that you wrote previously. You get new information on a daily basis. You see different things on a daily basis. And I don't think anybody saw the Cavs starting this season um, 13-0. and um, I don't think it's been the most difficult schedule in terms of the opponent that they've played against, but still 13 and 0 is very, very different than I think even the greatest Cavs optimist would have thought coming into this season. So Vegas had them set at 48 and a half, I want to say, and they're a quarter of the way um, to that total. um, And it's less than a full month into the season. So yeah, I think you definitely have to revise your feeling. Um, I think you definitely have to revise whether or not you believe that the Cavs can get the one seed in the Eastern Conference. I think there's a pathway for them to get the one seed. I think um, the way that they've played to start the season, to me, is not just a flash in the pan. It's not just a mirage. It's it's something that can continue to carry over. And if anything, um, I think there are reasons to believe that the Cavs 
are going to get better. Like, look, they're going to face adversity. They're going to have issues that pop up throughout the course of the regular season. But they've gone 13-0 and without a very, very important piece, and that's Max Struess. So when he comes back, I think this team can continue to get better as Evan Mobley continues to get more comfortable um, with this level of usage in this particular role. I think he can get better and the Cavs can get better as Donovan um, continues to find his place within this offense and what's best for him and the team on a nightly basis and all those different things. Like, yeah, I think there's a level of regression that's probably going to happen when it comes to some guys and their shooting numbers and stuff like that. But I also think there are reasons to believe that this team is going to continue to get better as the season goes on. Um, with more reps together, with more time for Kenny Atkinson to install more things at both ends of the floor, and with Max Struess rejoining this lineup in in some capacity. So I I definitely think the way that they have started and the fact that they're already 13-0, I think anybody that has watched this team in the first 13 games and would not be willing to revise their, their season win total and whether there's a legitimate chance for them um, to capture the number one seed in the Eastern Conference, I think you would be foolish to have that stance. Chris, and for me, like, obviously, I'm in the moment. We are in the present. We are at the games. You, especially, traveling with the team at almost every glance, right? Like, we're watching the Cavs. We're watching something unfold that is historic also in the franchise, but also in NBA history itself. But I'm also looking at the other teams in the standings, right? Like, I am looking at what the other um, contenders, quote-unquote, that we had listed in our uh, previews for the season and where they're at to start the year, right? And Mm -hmm. to be fair, it's been ugly for a lot of these teams, right? And you you (laughs) mentioned the Philadelphia 76ers, who are 2-9. and And then you talk about the Milwaukee Bucks, who are 4-8. and And then you talk about the Miami Heat, who are four and six. And to be really, to be very frank, there are three teams in the entire Eastern Conference with a winning record. Talking Uh about this at 11.55 p.m. on Thursday, right? So if there's a game happening right now that could update this, sorry. But Orlando is in the third seed at seven and six. Boston, two seed, 10 and three. Cavs, one seed, 13 and 0. And then the Knicks are in the four seed. They're five and six. Indiana's right behind them at five and six. And then you got to go all the way down to the nine seed to get to the Miami Heat, who we had next in contention, right? Obviously, the Atlanta Hawks have been looked interesting, even without Trey Young, all these different things. And we've talked about it. There is no never say never, never say no um, when it comes to the NBA because things can change. But Mm -hmm. For me, how this, how the Eastern Conference has started, and Kenny Atkinson has mentioned it, it's hard to come back from a poor start to the season. Hard yep. to come back from a deficit, even in an NBA game as it is. So getting out fast is great, not only for standings, not only for morale, not only for history purposes, but it sets them up for success when you talk about trying to be in that one and two situation for the end of the season to avoid playing Boston until the Eastern Conference Finals. Well, I think that's also a good point that you make because I think, you know, part of my prediction when when it came to the season, I had them at 52 and 30 coming into the year, um, which was over their, their projected win total, but below Boston in the Eastern Conference. Part of the reason why... I was a little bit more hesitant to go higher on that win total is because I, I thought the East was going to be a dogfight. And circumstances have changed that. When is Chris Middleton even going to start working out for the Milwaukee Bucks? It's clear that they miss him. And Doc Rivers has not been able to find the recipe for, for Milwaukee to be a great upper echelon team. Now, Milwaukee's about to go into a stretch where the schedule is incredibly favorable for them, and they can probably rack up some wins here really, really quickly. But Milwaukee has been a disappointment. 
Um, New York has been a disappointment. Miami has been a disappointment. So what I thought the Eastern Conference was going to be and the challenge that that was going to provide in the Eastern Conference, um, especially for the Cavs to, to pile up a bunch of wins, it's not as formidable as I viewed it to be coming into this year for for a variety of reasons. Even Orlando, how much longer are they going to be without Paolo? Um, so there are just a bunch of circumstances that are playing into the favor of the Cavs right now when it comes to the Eastern Conference. Uh, the West is clearly the, the better conference from top to bottom. And, you know, with the Cavs being able to um, go through this schedule, um, especially early on, and, and bank a bunch of wins and build some positive momentum and get some chemistry and stuff like that and take advantage of these opportunities that are in front of them, um, that that is going to be meaningful when it comes to them potentially um, getting the one or two seed and just being on the opposite side of the bracket of Boston. Because it's like, there was a legitimate conversation about, okay, if Boston's going to be number one, now who's going to be two? Is it going to be Cleveland? Is it going to be New York? Is it going to be Philly? Is it going to be uh, Milwaukee? Is it going to be Orlando? And, and I think logically coming into this season before all of this stuff happened, I think you could have made a case for each one of those teams. And I think it could have been a strong, compelling case. Here's why it could be New York. Here's why it could be Milwaukee. Here's why it could be Philadelphia. Now it just feels like Boston, Cleveland, one, two. You know what I mean? And if that means, and if that's going to carry itself over um, for the duration of the season, then that means the Cavs get ultimately what they would need. And that's avoid Boston for as long as possible. And if, if you think that Boston's going to get the one seed, cool, that's fine. But the pathway for the Cavs to either get the one or the two, I don't know what the probability of one or two is yet. It's still so early. But that probability is way higher than it was coming into this season. All right, Chris, last question from our subtexters. And it's a good one, but I want to rephrase it a little bit to get a better intel on you about where you feel these players are at. It's from Mitch in Reno, Nevada. He says, the Cavs have three expiring contracts. Karis LeVert, Ty Jerome, Craig Porter Jr. Actually, I don't, I don't think that's accurate, right? He signed a four-year deal. Well... Craig Porter Jr.'s contract is wonky, um, and, and it's one that the Cavs can easily get out of because of the guarantees and stuff like that. So I kind of understand why somebody would lump Craig Porter Jr. into that. Okay, interesting. Well, that's good to know, one, going forward. Two, I feel like the 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 main two that I wanted to focus on with this question are Karis Over and Ty Jerome. For me... And this per and Mitch talks about it, like the Cavs are already ha- going to have an increase in their payments when it comes to the extensions that they did this off season and all that going into next year, um, and that might put them um, in a little bit of some money issues. So the question is, do you see them making any moves to get under the cap so they won't be a tax repeater next year, and also? How difficult are Karras and Ty making this decision on the Cavs? I know it's early, but they have both made extreme impacts on this team. Karras LeVert, I believe, is number one in the NBA when it comes mm-hmm. to plus minus um, per game. And I think he might be number two total <laughs> under maybe Jason Tatum. So. What, what are your thoughts on how those two have been playing and then their salary implications as well? I just don't think, based on Dan Gilbert's history, I just don't think he's going to reverse course and start operating as, as somebody who is worried about some of these stipulations um, when it comes to the salary cap. And look, some of these are more penal than they've been in the past, and it's causing other franchises around the NBA to be really, really cognizant of their spending. 
but but if they get into the tax and if they get close to the second apron um dan gilbert's not going to start making cost cutting moves where he demands that Karis Levert gets traded because he's not going to be able to get re-signed or somebody's going to get cut so that they can get further away from that particular line. If there's something that Dan has shown throughout his tenure as, as chairman of the Cavs, it's that when the team is worth spending on and when the team is a legitimate contender, he's willing to do what it takes within reason to make sure that all of the resources are there for the team to chase that championship. So I, I don't sense that the Cavs are looking at their financials into the future and saying, we've got to cut salary or else. Um, in saying that, like the way that things are right now in the NBA, um, it is very, very difficult to have high price guys at the top and also pay, you know, ancillary pieces, guys coming off the bench, part-time starters, however you want to characterize them. It's hard to pay them between like 15 and $20 million because there just isn't that, that level of balance that you would need. Uh, Darius Garland's going to make 40. Donovan Mitchell's going to make 50. Evan Mobley is going to make 40. Jared Allen's going to make 28. You know what I mean? So it's like, how much more room is there for those other pieces? It, and I think the Cavs are going to run into their biggest issue this offseason. And I think it's going to be Karras. If Karras continues to play this kind of level, where he is a steady performer coming off the bench, he's in the conversation for six man of the year. Um, he's going to want, and he's probably going to command a contract in the range of like 15 to 20, give or take, um, it's it's hard to specifically put a number on it um, just because there are so many things that we're still figuring out when it comes to this new salary cap structure and how one team views Karis might be a little bit different than how another team views Karis. But I think you can honestly say that if he has that kind of season, if he continues this, that's a 15 to $20 million player. Can the Cavs afford that with all the other high price guys that they have on the roster? It becomes a little bit trickier. So I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen with Karras this off season and, and what the Cavs will be willing to give um, to a guy that's in that kind of role because Karras is important. There's no doubt about it. He's the six man of this team. Um, he's the anchor of the second unit. He's a secondary playmaker. Um, he's a ball handler. He's a scorer. He's an elite defender. He brings a level of versatility. He's got comfort in Kenny Atkinson's system. All those different things. But he's not Donovan. And he's not Darius. He's not Jared. He's not Evan. He's not a member of the core four. And if you're paying all all of that money to your core four, where are you going to be able to find the resources to give Karras the kind of contract that he's going to want? Um, and it doesn't mean that they don't have a level of flexibility. They do. There are other moves that they could theoretically make. Trade George Niang. Trade Dean Wade. You know, trade Max Struess. All of those things are possibilities. Right, you're going to have to consider a bunch of different moves when you're talking about this new salary structure. But I just think the Cavs are going to have a really, really difficult time um, keeping Karis LeVert beyond this year. And that doesn't mean that I think that they should go out and explore trades for him because the opportunity in front of them, I think, is legitimate. And I think they need to capitalize on that. And Karis is a big part of that. And making a significant change like that at the trade deadline and shaking up your roster um, and changing your team that dramatically at the trade deadline is very, very risky. And I would caution the Cavs when it comes to that, even though he is on an expiring deal, even though he does have value around the NBA um, that goes beyond just his contract. And even though I think it's going to be hard for them to keep him beyond this year. Um, I think this is a go for it type year for the Cavs, 
especially the way things are shaking out um, in the Eastern Conference. And for, obviously, this is early into the season, and we're not saying that guys aren't coming into the season understanding what their contract situation is at the end of the year. They surely do, but it just feels like this entire team has bought into the bigger picture, Chris. Mm -hmm. Like, this team is worried about getting to April, May, June, and beyond, and then figuring out what they have going on individually. This selflessness of this team has created that bond that it's like, okay, we'll figure that out when the time comes, but also in the back of your head, like, if I play to the best of my ability and do what this team asks of me and play with the confidence that Kenny Atkinson, Donovan Mitchell have instilled, that's going to make the conversation even more difficult when the time comes because that will lead you to play to your best capability, to your highest potential. And obviously other teams are watching and trying to figure out, well, will that work in our system? Will that work with our um, surrounding players and all those different things? Like Karis LeVert is as impactful as he is. Great player, great facilitator, great defender. Sure, it's also because on the defensive end, you usually have at least one seven-footer behind you to help mm -hmm. you out. And on mm -hmm. offense, you have one, maybe two, at the same time, all-star guards playing right next to you, taking advantage of those situations as well. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with Jalen Tyson and getting reps for him and seeing how he could fill in for the role of Karis LeVert in a smaller capacity if they aren't able to bring him back next summer. But yeah, I mean, when they drafted Jalen Tyson 20th overall, we've talked about this a number of different times, Ethan, and I've written about this a number of different times. Um, in their own mind, he was the down the road replacement for Karis LeVert. He wasn't an immediate impact player. He wasn't going to be an immediate rotation player. They were thinking big picture. They were thinking, can we get somebody young, somebody cheap on a team friendly, controllable contract that can do some of the stuff at both ends of the floor um, that we're getting from Karras. I'm, I'm not talking about stylistically the same kind of player, but Karras in the role that he is in down the road, can a younger, more uh, team-friendly contract type player provide that level of production or something close to that? And that's part of the beauty of somebody like Jalen Tyson. If, if he hits, right? If he becomes the player that the Cavs are hoping that he can become, if he can become a consistent every night rotational player in the NBA, which remains to be seen. Um, that's the beauty of having somebody like Craig Porter Jr. on such a small deal. Um, if they start to believe that he is ready to be a full-time backup point guard in the NBA, then they've got a controllable backup point guard that's making $2 million per year. That's a big-time benefit. That means they don't have to pay another guy 8 to $10 million to be that backup point guard. You know what I mean? So all these things are going to matter. But when they drafted Jalen Tyson 20th overall, it was thinking, big picture, down the road, can he be Karras' eventual replacement? How is it to be back home? Good to be back home, Ethan. I had one last cheesesteak before I left Philadelphia this afternoon. Uh, easy flight, short flight, small plane, bumpy landing because it was raining. But it was great to be back home. Um, my son was napping at the time that I came back home and my wife went in to go get him and said, I have a surprise for you. And I somersaulted into his bedroom because that's how I enter. Um, and he thinks it's absolutely hilarious. So I come somersaulting and he starts cracking up. And that's how that's how he learned that daddy was home. And it was a great night the rest of the night. So glad to hear it. Always good to have uh, time with Elliot and also with your wife after you get back. I mean, Chris, this is, you talk about the cheesesteak, right? Did, did the last place you went to oblige with your request to have them put the cheese on the side, as crazy as that sounds? Uh, yes, they looked at me funny because I made that request again. And I said, no, I'm serious. Can you just put it in a little cup? 
whatever you want to charge me for it, it's fine within reason, but I just want to be able um, to determine how much cheese whiz I put on my own cheesesteak. And they said, okay, that's fine. So instead of getting fries with my cheesesteak, I had a bag of chips already from the 76ers arena. Shout out to me for taking an extra bag and stuffing them in my in my suitcase just in case. And uh, and then instead of getting fries, I got cheese sauce on the side. So it was it was perfect. It worked out nicely for me. It was Tony Luke's this time. So cross Tony Luke's off my um, off my list of, of cheesecakes cheesesteak spots in uh in philadelphia so you basically had chips and cheese with cheesesteak interesting very nice very nice yeah 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 yeah. regular lays chips and every now and then i would dip them in the cheese whiz yeah it's pretty good try it sometime it's just like fries but it's a chip form (laughs) yes yes chris they're both potatoes (laughs) thank you for that very well, you were looking at me like I had three heads or something like that. Yes, I, I felt I'm, like it was very creative on my behalf. Creative, no, because I feel like everybody <laughs> growing up, when they have a sandwich, you dip the Lay's chips or the whatever the chips are into some kind of substance, whether it's ranch or cheese or whatever they had growing up in the cafeteria. But so, no, I'm not giving you points for <laughs> dipping chips and cheese. I was giving you a face because I thought you were talking about like tortilla chips or something that oh. you had got from the stadium during the arena, not oh, Lay's no, no, no. chips. <laughs> no, just Lay's original chips. Uh, that's what they had. They had those in the arena with they had Doritos, they had Cheetos, they had um, Philly pretzels, of course. Um, and I decided to get the Lay's chips because I was wondering, am I going to go to a place where I could get a cheese steak before I leave Philly? Am I going to have enough time before I get to the airport? So I stuffed an extra bag of Lay's original chips in my computer bag. And I'm very, very happy that I did that. So shout okay. out to me for thinking ahead. Yeah, shout out to you, Chris, for <laughs> helping yourself out. Your future self was very happy with you, clearly. But <laughs> okay, now we now we have to have this conversation, and, and I'm sorry to our our listeners that are like getting into basketball talk. Like I'm good. I I don't know if our readers or listeners or watchers, wherever you get this, have realized or picked up on this. I usually move this to the end of the podcast now if we start with it, so that people can get the immediate. Uh, uh, sports takes and whatever and then if they want to stay for the fun chit chat that we do before each Uh podcast they have the option to do that at the very end but chris okay so they had all of these different options and you decided to go with lays chips uh, why lays chips because i i would have gone doritos i don't care and obviously everybody knows lays chips 50 percent of the bag is air yeah so here's the thing I was thinking ahead and I was wondering if I was going to have enough time to get to a cheesesteak spot before leaving Philadelphia. And I thought to myself, hmm, what would be the best bag here in case that does happen? I don't know. For some reason, nacho cheese Doritos with a cheesesteak? Nacho cheese with cheese whiz. That doesn't sound appealing. No. no, not really. No, it's it's the taste. It's the combining of the taste that you're just missing right now, Ethan. And and the Lay's are the closest thing to French fries. So if you're going to eat a cheesesteak, or at least if I'm going to eat a cheesesteak, I want original chips or I want French fries because I want that kind of flavor in my mouth. I don't want like Cool Ranch Doritos. I don't want Cheetos. I don't want nacho cheese Doritos because then I think you're just mixing too many flavors in there and you lose the authenticity of the cheesesteak. But you don't lose the authenticity of the cheesesteak no. by taking the cheese off the cheesesteak. I, I gotcha. I, no. I'm, just pulling, I'm just pulling your leg, Chris. I'm just the pulling whiz, your leg at this point. Not the cheese itself. I get provolone or I get American or I get Swiss, what I've, whatever I feel like. It's, it's the whiz... I don't take it off necessarily. I determine better how much whiz I'm going to use per bite. 
I think it's I, brilliant. I just, I'm really pulling Chris's leg on today's podcast. This, <laughs> like, this is this is the journalist, the curiosity that everybody asks about, what questions we ask in the locker room. Like, this is how it goes. Like, if there's something that they say that goes off of it, and we just continue off of these basis um, and, and obviously the back, behind the scenes questions and discussions are much better than the interviews. Oh, by the way, asked. by the way, to that point, Ethan, I am well known in that Cavs locker room as a dude who likes to eat. That's how they know me. So when I go to these different cities, you know, these players are asking me what I get. These players are asking me where I go. I was having a conversation in the locker room um, prior to the 76ers game with Jared Allen. And Jared asked me what I got into the night when I arrived. And I told him, I thought about him, pause. Um, I thought about him because I went to um, a Thai place, a Thai with a mix of Asian. And, and that's, you know, Jared loves that kind of cuisine. So he asked me about it and I told him what I ordered. And then he asked me if I ordered a certain kind of thing as an appetizer. So all of the players inside the locker room know me as the dude who, um, who loves being on the road in part because of the meals that I get while I'm on the road. So they always ask me about where I go. In fact, uh, Darius Garland and I, um, in, in that same conversation, after finishing the conversation with Jarrett, uh, we started having a different conversation about our favorite cities to visit on the road. And we both brought up Toronto um, and he brought up that, that his favorite restaurant across the NBA is also my favorite restaurant across the NBA. And it just so happens that it's in Toronto and we are on the same page. And I feel like um, that brought us a little bit closer because we have a love for Soto Soto in Toronto. Chris, I was going to say, based on a, a small comment you made earlier in the podcast, that you had either been hanging around me or Darius too much anyway. So that <laughs> ending just ties it all up into a bow. That makes a whole lot of sense when you talk about how you guys are one of two peas in a pod and two brains. We know the relationship that you have with Darius when it comes to just as a reporter and a player, but also off of that and that is something that is special. That's why everybody comes to the Wine and Gold Talk <laughs> podcast to listen and hear all about the stories. And for you guys that are just here for the basketball, you're missing out. <laughs> By the way, those conversations were all after the fact that I did my reporting job and I found out whether or not Jared Allen was going to play before anybody else. So I did that first and then I started talking about food. So Chris is like was actively <laughs> writing the tweet or the text out to our subtexters about Jerry Allen playing while talking about Thai food. I just want you, to, the That's listeners, correct. to get a, a visual of what is going on in these away locker rooms because I. <laughs> that is correct. I, That's exactly what I did. With that being said, Chris, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs Insider and interact with Chris, me, and Jimmy, and he'll be back soon by subscribing to Subtext. This is where you can not only send your questions in for each week's Hey Chris, but you can also give feedback on the podcast through the link that we sent, or you can even just send anything that you want via text back to us, and we can have a conversation right then and there. So to get this access, sign up for a 14-day free trial, or visit cleveland.com backslash calves and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word stop. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the calves from me, Chris, and Jimmy. This isn't just our podcast. It's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.